Hi everyone, it's Mr. Sinti, and today I had the pleasure to be discussing with you and sharing my thoughts on cranial bones. That's right. Uh, this conversation is going to have to do with the particular bones uh, of the skull, but emphasizing the cranial bones. And when I say cranial bones, you're like, well, what other bones are there of the skull? Well, there's facial bones as well. And so I hope uh, that you'll stay tuned for another video on facial bones. But the cranial bones are really important, and this may seem obvious to you, but the, their main function is that of protection. And one of the most important internal organs to protect is the brain. And so you don't want any sort of brain trauma, like for example, uh, any, any sort of injury to the brain, like for example, concussion. And even these bones of the, of the cranium themselves can actually fracture, and so that, that's important. In addition, to protecting the brain, it also protects the cranial bones, protects the nasal cavity, and uh, again, the, the skull in general, perhaps not the cranial bones, but also protects the oral cavity. And so that's, that's a, one of the functions of the skull, is that of protection. And so in addition to protection, the bones of the skull are also uh, contain pockets, and these are hollow cavities that reduce, called sinuses, that reduce the weight of the, of the skull, uh, or else the skull would be a, a little difficult to sort of carry around. And inside these sinuses, when air passes into these, uh, some of the functions of the sinuses is to warm and to humidify the air, because the tissue that lines those sinuses are pseudo-stratified ciliated columnar, which produce mucus that trap dust particles and, uh, and protects the, uh, the, the entrance into the respiratory system. So I find that to be pretty cool, and that's, in, that's contained within the skull. And so, in earnest, our conversation is about these eight uh, cranial bones. And so they are occipital bone, which is posterior back here. You have this side bone called the temporal bone, which is sort of right next to your ear. And then you have the side of your, your cranium is a parietal bone. And do you notice how it says two here and two here? Obviously, or maybe not obviously, but the side, you have a left side. This is a lateral view. You have the left side of the skull, and there, there's a temporal bone here and on the other side. And you also have a parietal bone on this side and on the other side. But you have one frontal bone, one sphenoid bone, and one ethnoid bone. Okay, so it totals eight, which makes up the brain case or cranium. But I should mention, and I, and I will, that there's three tiny bones that are also involved accessory to the, to, the, to the skull, and those are auditory or hearing bones, auditory ossicles. And these three tiny little bones are really important. Without these three tiny bones, we wouldn't be able to hear at all. And so they are found in the tympanic cavity or middle ear. And these three bones are the malleus, incus, and stapes, but commonly known as the hammer, anvil, and stirrup. And what their function is, is that when sound waves come in through the external auditory meatus, they bounce off of this eardrum or tympanic membrane, which creates uh, these bones, which are the auditory ossicles found in the, in the middle part of the ear, amplifies, amplifies and channels the sound waves to this internal bony structure in the inner ear. And in particular, the stapes, uh, pushes hard against this tiny membrane called the oval window. And believe it or not, this video is not about this, but it pushes against this bony structure and inside there's a, there's a lymph liquid, which then sloshes around inside this snail looking structure called the cochlea. And that's how hearing takes place. It's pretty awesome. Okay. So but back to the, to the cranial bones in general. So as I mentioned, the cranial bones form this cavity known as the cranial cavity, which contains the brain, okay? And the bones are held together by where they articulate, where they come together, the joints are called sutures. And so a suture, just to refresh you on that, if, you, if you're not familiar with it, a joint that is immovable is, is referred to as a, a suture. And so this is an immovable joint, also referred to as a sphin, or <laughs> arthrosis sing arthrosis difficult to say that and so uh, we're going to take a look now at some of these important um, sutures uh, you can see three of them here the coronal suture which 
uh, creates the frontal bone and, and the squamous suture, which separates the parietal and temporal and lamnoid. A couple more pictures of these. And there's also a sagittal suture as well. These are the four major sutures of the skull. So here you are looking posterior at the occipital bone right in here in the back. You can see this lamnoid suture, and it's lamnoid because it forms the Greek letter lambda right in there. And then it, form, it also creates the left and right parietal bones. The sagittal suture separates the parietal bones right in here. You may be familiar with the fact that the lambdoid suture can also have these little tiny bones called uh, sutural bones, which are found in the suture of the lamnoid. Uh, these are sometimes known as wor wormian bones. You have them or you don't have them, but they can vary in size, but they're often pretty small. Uh, the frontal suture, as you can see here, creates the forehead uh, right in here. And collectively, the top of the, of the skull or calvaria is known as the skull cap. Okay, And again, looking here at a superior view, in other words, looking down, you can see the sagittal suture quite well. Here's the lambdoid suture, and then you can see the frontal uh, uh, bone, which is created by the coronal suture right in here. Uh, again, looking down in... Uh, uh, at the sagittal suture right there. And then here's the squamous suture, which creates the, the temporal bone separate from the parietal bone. Okay, And then finally, another lateral view. You can see the coronal suture, the squamous. The occipital uh, bone is formed by the lambdoid suture. And then up here, which you can't see, is the sagittal suture. Okay, so now let's take a journey and look at these cranial, cranial bones. And so I'm hoping that you'll enjoy this. We're just going to take, uh, remarkably, a brief look at these bones. And I want to point out some of the more important features. In other words, the markings. Um, some processes and perhaps some foramen uh, that, are, that are critical um, uh, when discussing these bones. So let's first off talk about the occipital bone. And I happen to have a skull here with me. And so you might be able to see that the occipital bone forms the posterior part of, of, of the cranium, but it also forms the inferior part of the cranium. And you may know, noticeably, it has a, a magnum <laughs> foramen right there. In other words, a big hole, uh, which allows the spinal cord to come out right there. That's so the occipital lobe. Oh, I'm sorry, the occipital uh, uh, bone of the brain. Now, again, let me bring the skull back on here. This may be obvious, but the, the skull sits on the top of the, of the backbone or, or vertebrae. And in particular, the occipital bone is what rests on the top of the backbone, right on these two condyles right, up, right here. And they rest on top of the very first cervical vertebrae. And as you can see in this picture here, they, re they rest right on, this is a, a, a superior uh, view looking down on, on the uh, very first cervical, cervical one, which is called the atlas, because it's sort of like holding up the world, holding up the, the skull. It, those sit on the superior articular facets. And so that's where the, the, the skull is sitting on these two pads right in here, these two lateral masses on both sides. And so the occipital bone also articulates uh, with the uh, parietal bone, and it also articulates with the temporal bone and sphenoid bone on the inside of the of the skull. Okay, more about that. And so this uh, these condyles that I was referring to before, this is an inferior view. These sort of projections right here sit very nicely right on these pads and these facets of the cerv first cervic cervical vertebrae uh, of the backbone. Okay, uh, some. Other uh, markings of the occipital bones is that they have the, this inferior and superior nuchal lines right in here, if you can see that. Uh, those are important. Those are functionality. Those are attachment sites for muscles and ligaments. Ligaments are connecting to other, other bones. Uh, we also have in the back of the, of the skull, we have this protuberance. In other words, a big bump. External occipital protuberance. The back you can actually feel it if you rub your fingers if you palpate on the back of your occipital bone you can figure feel that uh, external uh, protuberance which is kind of significant i mentioned this before when i was showing the skull right in here you can see that this large opening is the foramen magnum right in here and then here are the occipital condyles which articulate with the cervical vertebrae um, 
Here's a picture of the foramen magna where the spinal cord comes out. This is again looking uh, as an inferior view, looking up uh, at, at the skull. And as you can see it right over here, and it connects um, the cranial cavity with the spinal cavity. That's what that, that hole is. Now, in addition to that foramen magna, there's some other foramen. Uh, you may be familiar with some of the more common blood vessels uh, that are found in the neck that travel up from the heart into the brain are the carotid arteries and the jugular veins. And so the jugular veins take deoxygenated blood from the brain down toward the heart. And so they come out of these two little holes right in here uh, called the jugular foramen. You can see them right quite prominently on both sides of the foramen magna. And that's for the jugular vein. You can see the jugular veins located right in here. Okay. Uh, you also have this uh, tinier uh, foramen right over here, which is known as the um, hypoglossal canal. And this particular hypoglossal ca canal is, uh, it's for nerves uh, that are found below the tongue. So it's sort of connected to below the tongue. That's what that's glossal standing for. This is superior view, meaning you're looking now inside the cranial cavity uh, at the occipital bone, which is down here. And you can see right in here, here's the hypoglossal canal. Uh, now we're looking up or inferior view. You can see the hypoglossal canal right there. You can see the, the, the uh, occipital condyles, which are connecting to the vertebrae. You can see here is the big protuberance right over here. All right. Now let's take a look at the parietal bone. Parietal means side. Uh, it comes up a lot in anatomy, and it, it's the big. It's basically the side of the skull. So it's uh, the or or a wall, if you will, and, it, and it, it's it, it's this big flat area right here, and it and it um, it forms um, you know the superior meaning the top of the of the skull and also the side of the of the skull or cranium as well, and so. It articulates with a lot of different bones. It, it, do, it articulates with the temporal bone, occipital bone, uh, the sphenoid bone, and also the frontal bone. Some of its markings is that it has a superior and, inf and inferior temporal line right there. You're like, well, why were, why were those important? Well, uh, not in and of themselves, but you can see them. You can see these lines on the side of the parietal bones, and, and their significance is that they attach to this temporalis uh, temporalis muscle, which is on the side of your, if you feel it on the side of your, of your skull, you can feel that bone right there. And so frontal bone, which is created by the coronal suture, it, it makes up the forehead, the interior part, if you will, the front of your cranium, and it also forms the upper eye sockets, as you can see here in this picture. Uh, I should mention that the, the frontal bone contains frontal sinuses in order to reduce the weight of the skull and also to uh, warm, humidify, and cleanse air as it's coming into the uh, respiratory system. So some of the markings of the bone, uh, of the frontal bone, is we have this supra, meaning above orbital margin right in here, which protects the eye, okay, right in this area right here, margin. Now this is looking up or inferior. Uh, we have this lacrimal fossa, which is this little slight indentation where the tear ducts will, will travel right in here. Uh, you, you have a lacrimal gland, which produces uh, tears, which will <laughs> travel through the ducts into the eyes to protect the eye. Uh, we also have these uh, supraorbital foramen, these holes basically right up here above the eye sockets, which allow blood vessels uh, to come in and out of the skull uh, to provide nourishment for the uh, for the eyelids and, and it also connects to the the frontal sinuses and uh, so that's important and then we have this sort of an incomplete foramen uh, you can notice here it's known as a superorbital notch this little indentation right over here on the top of the eye socket which is kind of interesting now temporal bone uh, the temporal bone forms the side of the skull right over here. And so part of the, of the lateral wall of the, of the cranium, you can see this 
what's referred to as the zygomatic arch. And, and, and as you can see here, uh, the temporal bone uh, is part of that. In addition to the zygomatic bone, which is, which is known as your cheekbone, right in here, there's like a little archway right there. It, so the temporal bone articulates with the mandible, which is, the, which is your jaw bone. And so one of its functions, the temporal bone, is, is to surround and protect the inner ear, which is obviously on the inside of the skull. Okay, and so more about that, <laughs> temporal bone. And so uh, temporal bone, as you can see here highlighted in purple, articulates with a lot of the bones in, uh, in the skull and also facial bones right over here in the mandible as well. And so the, the markings of the temporal bone, you have this flat area, or this flat part of the, of the temporal bone right in here, which is known as the squamous or flat part. And again, it borders the, the squamous suture right up there. And then you have this protuberance that's, that comes out here known as the zygomatic process of the temporal bone, which, part, which creates the temporal part of the zygomatic arch. Okay? And that's inferior to the squamous part. And then, as I mentioned before, it forms, uh, it connects with the zygomatic uh, portion of that process, which forms your, your, your cheekbone. Uh, this is an area I find pretty interesting right in here. And so where the temporal bone articulates with the mandible, you have what's known as the mandibular fossa. So the mandibular fossa is this little indentation right in here in the temporal bone, which articulates with the mandibular condyle, which is number one. So this is part of the jaw bone right there. Okay. You can see here, uh, some of the, this is pretty cool. You can look inside the, uh, the meatus right over here, and you can see these auditory ossicles, which is right, right in there. And so another markings of the temporal bone is that you have this big protuberance coming off the side here. Um, you can mark it over on this side, and it's referred to as the mastoid process. Uh, mastoid sort of meaning breast. I'm, I'm not seeing it, but it's basically an, an attachment point for, uh, for muscles. And it also connects to the, to the middle ear, mastoid process. And that's uh, also connected to the temporal bone highlighted here in gray is this really thin process that's coming out like a stylus or stiletto uh, heels, uh, styloid process. And that's an attachment point uh, for ligaments that will attach to the hyoid bone, which is found over here in your neck. Uh, and it also attaches to the tongue and larynx as well. Now, the temporal bone, when you're looking inside the cranium, uh, you can see this petrous part. In other words, this sort of elevated area inside the, the so this is interior, the elevated side of the temporal bone. And that encloses some of the inner ear structure, as you can see here in a sort of a cutaway. That's what houses the, the, the cochlea and semicircular canals, which are part of the inner ear. And so if you can see it here in the skull, it's like this area right in here that's sort of bulgy right in here, this petrous part of the temporal bone, looking down, inferior view. Okay, And, it, uh, and also you can see it encloses the middle ear as well, and that's where the auditory ossicles are, are uh, contained. Now, some of the other uh, openings or fora forama, foramia, <laughs> uh, or foramen, singular, of the temporal bones are uh, located here. You can see that there's a carotid canal uh, for the carotid artery. And again, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but the carotid artery is, uh, again, taking blood uh, away from the heart. So oxygenated blood that's pumping from the left ventricle is going up to the brain through the carotid artery. And it needs to travel into the, into the skull, into the brain through the carotid canal. And that's uh, found in the temporal bone. Uh, there's a, another uh, opening or, or foramen in the temporal bone. And that one is, again, one of the more common ones. It's literally like uh, the opening, which is referred to the external uh, uh, Acoustic meatus, in other words, this canal uh, ends up in the tympanic membrane or eardrum. And so sound is coming in. But the curious thing about that is that your ear, 
people refer to this the this outer structure this pinea as the ear which which this is basically cartilage capturing sound waves so that they don't just fly past the skull but ultimately the sound waves need to come through the external audio, uh, acoustic meatus and then travel down in addition to that uh, important foramen uh, you also have this styloid mastoid foramen which is located right in here which is important for facial nerves so uh, there are several of these. Uh, there's, um, you know, and again, this is the foramen, uh, which now we're looking internally. This is where the uh, auditory meatus canal is is uh, is coming into the um, into the ear. Uh, there's, do you notice? There's a lot of openings right in in this area, and so it's a it's a matter. I just wanted to pause for a moment here if you're feeling a little overwhelmed by the markings. It's a matter of, uh, of time and diligence and, um, you know, sitting with this material. I mean, you're welcome to pause the video at any time and sort of consider it. Uh, but uh, I hope you're enjoying it because, you know, it, it just, you know, again, superficially, we're just taking a quick look at some of these openings. And, you know, again, here is uh, we're looking here at the at the medial view. Uh, in other words, the the inside of the cranium. We're looking inside at the temporal bone and you can see where this is where sound would be coming in. This is the internal part. Here's the petrous part or raised part which encloses the internal bony structures uh, of the inner ear. Again, here's the mastoid process, the styloid process, the zygomatic process. Okay, And the squamous or flat part of the temporal bone. And then now this is looking lateral on the side at the right temporal bone. This is from the outside. Here's the squamous part. Here's a zygomatic process. Um, mandibular fossa. Again, here is the external, again, from the outside, uh, acoustic meatus. And mastoid process, styloid process, right over there. And again, inside the uh, external auditory me uh, meatus, or acoustic meatus, you can find those uh, auditory ossicles, which are pretty cool inside there. Let's move on to the sphenoid bone. Now the sphenoid bone is, as you can see here, colored in green. This is looking inside the cranium. And so you're looking down. So this is an, uh, a superior view. So you're looking down into the skull. And this is the, uh, this is the anterior part and this is posterior part right in here. And so people have characterized the sphenoid bone as looking like a bat. With, with its wings coming off to the side. And so I'm gonna stay with that sort of analogy. And then, you know, just coming up, this is the ethnoid bone, which is sitting uh, anterior to the sphenoid bone. Uh, and so it, it creates, the sphenoid bone creates the, the part of the floor of the cranium, and it unites the cranial and facial uh, bones. And it's and it sort of, you know, the, the keystone of, of the whole skull, if you will, it really strengthens because it, it articulates with so many of the other bones and it also contains sinuses as well. And so check a look at this list of articular articulations. It's pretty much connected to all of these bones and some of these are facial bones as well. And so it does look back like, and so uh, just to sort of look at some of its main markings, it has the, the main body right in here, the central axes of the sphenoid bone. And as you can see, it has like these wings that come off these these lesser wings and greater wings, as we're going to refer to them as. Okay, and and in particular, it has this region right on the on the top here that sort of reminded again, early anatomists of a saddle right here, the cella tersica, and it's a saddle shaped enclosure. And this is again the superior looking down at, at the sphenoid bone cell. So, Cella tersica. And you're like, well, what's the story with that? Well, the cella, cella tersica contains this little fossa, or in other words, this depression. And that is where the pituitary gland of, of the brain is housed. And so basically, in, in my judgment, this is like the most protected part of the entire body. And the pituitary gland sits right in that little saddle. It's a depression, the, the hypo... Uh, um, hypophyseal fossa is where the pituitary gland is sitting right in this structure with the, with the cella tersica. Okay. And so again, here is a, maybe a better view of these lesser wings. And then here are the greater wings of the 
uh, sphenoid. Now he mentioned that there are sinuses in there in order to maintain uh, lighter weight. Uh, the greater wings form uh, the cranial floor. Uh, the, there are spines which are located right over here, this and right here, which uh, which create the posterior wall of the orbit. Okay, and then you have these processes that come down here. Uh, I put it. I highlighted this yellow because it's. I believe it's pronounced pterygoid process. The pterygoid processes are coming down the P silent, come down here from the sphygmoid bone, and those are attachment areas uh, for muscles of the lower jaw and soft palate. Here's a better shot of the sinuses of the sphygmoid right in here. Here's the lesser wing on the top, and here's the greater wing down here. Okay, and again, there's some foramia or foramia of the sphenoid, in other words, foramen of the, of the sphenoid holes. These two holes in particular, you can see here, perhaps in, this, in, the, in the skull, you can see that these are openings uh, known as the optic canals, and those are optic nerves, because sitting right below that, or inferior to this, are, are the orbitals. And so the back of the eye, in particular, posterior, the optic nerve is coming out and they enter into the brain right up here through these optic canals. You can see it right there and right over there. Optic canals, which are openings for the optic nerves. Uh, you also have foramen rotundum, and this is for blood vessels to come into the uh, through the sphenoid, and also nerves of the face are coming through that particular foramen, as opposed to the optic ones. And then you have uh, the foramen ovale, which are also for blood vessels and nerves of the face, which are located here in the sphenoid bone, again, looking downward. And so a lot of openings in the sphenoid. Uh, a spinosum is also for blood vessels, uh, as you can see here, right there on that side, uh, and also on the other side uh, for blood vessels and nerves of the jaw. And then here is your pterygoid. This is a nice shot of the pterygoid uh, processes that come off on the side here. Right there, here's a big sinus right there. Lesser wings, greater wings over on this side. Okay, and this is kind of, I want to point this out, so I would go back here a little bit. So this is, you know, I was showing you a lot of shots from inside the, the skull, but it also, make, it's making up uh, the back or posterior part of the orbital, as you can see the sphenoid bone. Now, the ethmoid bone, uh, again, this is uh, looking down, superior view, uh, is also forming uh, the floor of the cranium, but yet the roof of the nasal cavity. And it also part, produces part of the nasal septum. Okay, so right in here, we're looking here, the nasal septum, but it's also right here, ethmoid bone. And it also creates the medial, or in other words, the middle side of the orbital wall. And it, and it contains a, a network, and, and boy, network is an understatement, a network of sinuses. Where do you see this? This is pretty cool. And so it articulates with many different bones um, uh, of, the, of not only the skull, but of, of the of facial bones. And, and in particular, I want to focus on three parts of the ethnoid, the, the cribiform plate and some, some lateral masses and a particular uh, perpendicular plate. So one of the, uh, one of the markings is in, in particular is this in the floor of the cranium right in here. So this is again, superior view that we have something known as the cribiform plate and the cribiform plate has these little opening for olfactory. Uh, connection. So this is where um, nerves are coming, olfactory nerves are coming up from your nasal cavity up into the brain. And so it's, it's, it's formed the roof of the nasal cavity. But it also has this strong projection right in here, as you can see in this actual cranium right there. This uh, is sort of the crown of, of the of the rooster, if you will, or, or the, the, the crown of the, of the cock, Christagalli. The Christagalli is a structure uh, that uh, pertu there's a protuberance inside the cranium, and it's an attachment point for the brain, the Christagalli. And here's the cribiform plate, which has these little tiny holes.
And so here you can see the cribriform plate. Here's the crystigalli. And this is this perpendicular plate, which forms the middle area of the nasal septum right in here. Now, it also forms what are known as the middle nasal conche and the uh, superior nasal conche. And inside here, there's, there's a labyrinth, a network of sinuses where air is able to circulate inside here. And again, to be warmed, uh, humidified, and cleansed. And as you can see here, uh, these are the different uh, sinuses or conche right in here of the uh, ethnoid bone. Here's the perpendicular plate coming down. So it's, this is collectively known as the, uh, the labyrinth, in other words, network of, uh, of canals inside the bone. And so you can see here that look at this structure. It's quite, it's quite remarkable. Here's the crystigalli that's inside the skull right in here. Uh, Again, this is uh, the perpendicular plate forms what's known as the uh, part of the nasal septum right in here. And then this is connected over here to the sinuses of the, of the face uh, as well. And so all of this network uh, is, is quite remarkable. Uh, here's another shot, as you can see inside the nose, you can see right in the center there is the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid bone, okay? Uh, another shot of it, superior view, looking down. Here's a nice shot of the the openings of the cribriform plate. Cribriform plate. Again, more shots of the of these olfactory uh, foramina uh, in the cribriform plate. And I, I mentioned this before. This is where olfactory nerves penetrate the skull, right in there. So that's of significance. The crystal gala, gala is right there. Now, to finish this conversation about uh, the uh, bones of the skull, I just wanted to sort of finish with, um, with an infant skull. You may know that when uh, a baby is born, the, the bones of the skull, the frontal bone, the parietal bone, occipital bone, the sutures haven't completely formed yet. And that's because the infant brain is still con continuing to grow. And these uh, places in which the uh, bones are coming together are known as fontanelles. And so these sutures haven't completely closed let yet. And so there's many ossification centers. If you're familiar with intra intramembrous membranous bone formation, it's different than en endochondrial formation, but you have these uh, bone cells that are forming sheets of, of bone, which make up the, the skull bone. So the fusion isn't complete at birth. And that that's not only to allow the brain uh, further growth, but it also allows the skull to sort of indent a little bit as it's passing through the birth canal when, when you're being uh, delivered uh, <laughs> uh, during labor. And so those are uh, those fontanelles are areas of fibrous connective tissue, and, and they're commonly known as soft spots. I think you might be familiar with that. And so um, there are sort of unfused sutures uh, in an infant skull and they allow again as I mentioned the skull to flex a little bit during the birthing process and, and there's a uh, an anterior fontanelle and a, and a posterior fontanelle right there and so there's two major soft spots of an infant uh, when they're when they're being delivered so cranial cavity uh, I hope you enjoyed it I hope I hope you learned a few things I hope you're not overwhelmed uh, it, it's a lot to take in. And, and again, here's a, uh, a sagittal uh, section right over here. So we're cutting the, the skull in the, in the left and right parts right there. And you're looking in here. So this is a little review of your frontal bone and parietal bone and temporal bone, occipital bone, et cetera, ethmoid bone and sphingoid bone uh, located right over here. And so a lot to take in. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, thanks for watching.